Um, so this session is about board recruitment. And my understanding is that um, some previous conversations among the Pune Strong uh, group, you had identified that as an area that you wanted to kind of know more about. And so hopefully, um, based on what was shared with me from the notes of your session, I'm going to try to hit as many of those things as I can. It's a short session, so we may not get to everything. Um, and I think we have some uh, paper up on the wall so that if there are questions that I can't get to or can't answer today, we'll capture that so that I can then get back to you with responses. And you'll all get copies of the slide decks, as I mentioned in the email. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, this morning about types of boards and life stages of nonprofits. It was really nice to hear in the room as you were introducing yourselves. You know, you're all at a little bit different stages, right? Some are just thinking about starting. Some are already starting up. Some are have been there for a while, doing really good work, finally hitting their stride, et cetera. So we'll talk about the board development cycle and where kind of recruitment comes into that. Um, think we're, we'll do some reflection about um, criteria that you might want to set as you're looking for new board members. Um, what to share about your organization as you're recruiting folks to the board. We sometimes forget that there are some important things that we need to articulate about ourselves that help us to attract the right board member fit for our organization. And then we'll talk just a little bit about setting and communicating clear expectations once folks are on our board. So it, this can apply also to folks that are already on your board. We haven't done it yet, but yeah, let, that's great. Let's do that now so that we level set and, and everybody understands what the expectations are. Um, and absolutely feel free to ask questions at any time. Sorry, I didn't have the mic very close. But if you have questions, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Also, be comfortable if you need to stand or do whatever you need to do. Totally fine with me. It will not distract me. <laughs> so I wanted to start with talking a little bit about the types of boards. Um, because I know that um, we have some different language that we use around this, and it's also important to understand our responsibilities as board members. When we're on an advisory board, which obviously the name kind of hints at what that is, right? It's a group that's brought together to advise or make recommendations, usually to an organization, um, sometimes to the governing board of an organization, um, maybe around a technical issue that the um, governing board doesn't have expertise in or just a community issue. We're bringing some folks together to advise this organization. Um, so folks who are on an advisory board are not responsible for making the ultimate decisions. They're advising and recommending, but they're not responsible ultimately for the decisions. And why that's really critical is it means you do not have legal responsibility as a board member on an advisory board. That's different from being on a governing board. So governing boards, as you can see, can be two kinds, and we'll talk about those in a moment. But when you're on a governing board, you are responsible for decision making. And in the second session today, we're going to talk a little bit more about what all that looks like. Um, and you are the owners of the organization and have legal responsibility. So when you're on a governing board, you need to know that. Now. The other thing that's important to know is that governing boards can be one of two kinds and what we might call administrative or, or a working board, meaning there isn't any staff, right? We're an all volunteer organization. We might always be an all volunteer organization. We're working board members, meaning we both set the policy for the organization and we get in there, roll up our sleeves and we do this stuff. We implement, right? Um, or we can be a policy making board, meaning there are staff in place, and so the board's role is now a little bit more of an oversight role. We're still actively engaged, but we're providing oversight, we're setting policy for the organization, but there's staff in place to actually implement the day-to-day -day work of the organization, right? So um, anybody wanna just maybe show of hands, is your board a working board, meaning all volunteer, we're doing the policy and the work, okay, a couple of people. And then others are you, your sort of policy making, right? Okay, gotcha. You can have a mixed board though too, right? You might, right, in the sense that, well, and we'll maybe in the second session talk a little bit more about that too, in the sense that there are times when we have to, as board members, step in more closely, right? Like if there's an executive transition, even if we're a sort of 
policy setting board and we're not doing the day-to-day -day work. As board members, we have to actually step in and do a lot more work in those kinds of moments. So, yeah. But Paige, you want to share what you're describing, like, yeah, or you might have I a mix. Yeah. In our organization, we have um, board members that actively um, <clears throat> do certain projects, uh -huh. and then the broader work and the group of executive directors. Yeah. So you're probably still technically what I would consider to be a policy making board. But we'll talk about in the, I think this is in the second session too. It's hard because normally I do this all as one session and I'm splitting it apart in a little unusual way. But, but it's, it's what you're getting at that's really important, Paige, is we have two hats when we're on a board, right? We have that sort of governance hat where we're all together as a group, setting policy, setting the vision, right? Then we have our management support hat. And that's when we, if we have management in place, we're supporting them by coming and helping out with events, by providing access to funders or resources, opening doors. So we act in both roles on boards often, right? Um, so you might still be a policy making board because you do have staff, but you are, it sounds like you have some good folks who are really hands-on at certain points when you need that extra support well, from the board. I wouldn't even, it's, they have certain projects that they just do. Uh, okay. And actually, sometimes separate from costs. staff, it's not a staff related kind of thing. Right. Okay. And, and that actually causes some conflict uh, sometimes yeah. because as policy making, yeah. they might be a little too supportive of their own particular way of doing the project. Sure. Yeah. And you know, that that's a, that's a interesting kind of um, situation that you're describing, which probably often is also that happens when organizations are sort of starting up and moving forward, right? And the board members have been in that capacity. And then we're kind of shifting a little bit and we may still keep some of that and move some into the new sort of mode. So you're in kind of dual modes at the moment, which can get a little bit complicated, but it can also work, right? So um, we'll, are you staying for the second session? I'm sorry, I have a class. Okay, so I'll send out all the information, but yeah. Okay, great. And we'll talk more about that. But. Yeah, thank you, Paige. I was wondering, given, yeah. given your comments with yeah. legal responsibilities for the yeah. two organizations, are you at some point mentioning DNO insurance? Yes, that's in presentation number two. <laughs> we will definitely be talking about DNO insurance. <laughs> Yay, Susie, for bringing that up. Yes. So, this type of uh, responsibilities, mm -hmm. does this apply not only to 501c3s, but also 501c4s? Yes. Yeah. So good, really good question. Um, most of the material that I go over is specifically geared to 501c3s in terms of the compliance, but in these areas, it applies equally to any 501c whatever. It could be a C7, C12, C whatever. There's a bunch of C things. You still have to, if you are on the board of an organization that does not have staff, I mean, that does have staff, I'm sorry, and you are making the, the decisions and, and sort of setting the vision, et cetera, um, versus being on an advisory board, right? So, sorry, if you're on a governing board versus an advisory board of whatever kind of 501C, you are legally responsible for the organization. And we'll talk about what that, what that looks like. Good questions. Okay. So life stages, right? Like human beings, organizations have life stages. Um, and you've already started to share a little bit about kind of where your organizations are in their life stages. But the reason that it's important for us to talk about life stages is that um, good governance looks different at different life stages. And we're also going to kind of, I'm giving a little bit of context here before we get to the kind of recruiting piece of it. Um, but I think it's important for us to acknowledge that some of where we are in our life stage might also affect the kind of board members that we're looking for, right? So again, you can see it all up there, but you know, usually nonprofits start with that sort of imagine and inspire stage where a couple people come together, they have a vision for something that would be awesome to do, or in response to, right, as many of your organizations might be a disaster. Something bad has happened, people are in need, we wanna get together and do something about it, right? And at that stage, we don't even have a board. We're just a group of people with this important idea and we're motivated and we're just kind of getting in there and, and starting. Um, most times we then move into what's called found and frame. 
um, where essentially we realized that, yeah, okay, this is really a thing, right? We got together, we did some good stuff. It's getting some traction. So now maybe we might want to kind of organize it a little bit. So this is the point at which we think about maybe becoming a 501c3, right? We think about maybe getting that exempt status at the state level and at the federal level because we realize too that if we want to get donations from different people and from foundations, we want to get grant money, having the 501c3 status is a benefit because we can give our donors a tax deduction when they make a contribution to us. Um, 501c4s and c3s behave a little differently and in presentation number two I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but this is the point at which we're kind of laying the foundation for the organization. So at this stage we do have to have a board. Now we're actually formalizing. We need to have a board. The state of Hawaii says you have to have at least three board members. Doesn't say you have to have more than that. Many of us do because three is a little small number. Um, but you have to minimally have, have three board members. Um, but at this stage, it's also typically a working board, right? We don't have staff yet. We're just the board. We're still doing all the work of the organization at this stage. Some organizations, <clears throat> if they keep going and, and things are going well, might move into that ground and grow stage where we're expanding. And we are saying, okay, there's enough going on and we have some resources we can actually hire some staff, and that might help us to be able to more efficiently do this really good work that we're doing. Um, and so we're kind of shifting from being, if we're board members, really hands-on all the time to slightly more hands-off in some areas that staff is going to take over, and a little bit more kind of on the providing oversight and direction and making sure things continue to go along the way that you know we sort of built the organization to be. And this is one of those places where a picture, you know, this is like your teenager, right? Where um, it's everything's a little awkward, right? Because we've created this organization. If we're the founders, we had the vision. We've put this beautiful, wonderful thing together. And now we have to entrust it to somebody else on the staff side who's going to make the day-to-day -day decisions. So we better pick right, right? <laughs> like it's a big responsibility. We still as board members have responsibility, but we're handing off some of that to somebody else. And so we want to make sure they really get our vision and they're aligned with our values and they're going to, you know, represent us well. Um, so we're, you know, we're becoming more independent as an organization, but there can be some growing pains. Um, many times, you know, if, if we've expanded like that, we've got some staff in place. We're going to move into the produce and sustain stage, which is you know, we're established, we're do, having a lot of programmatic success, things are going well. The board has probably moved at that point into that more policy making kind of role. Um, and generally things are humming along and, and going well. And then you see sort of the next stage, which many organizations went through during COVID, right? You, even if they had just started up, they almost immediately went into review and renew because everything changed. We all had to pivot and do things very differently. Um, but a lot of times what happens is an organization that might have been around for a while, some things start to change. There's some transition going on. For some of us, like I'll give you the example of, of, of our organization. When I started with the organization, it was not called HANO. It was Hawaii Community Services Council. And we were more of a planning council. We were very health and human service nonprofit kind of focused. Um, and what started to happen was some of our traditional funders, back in those days, Aloha United Way heavily funded that organization and provided a lot of the money for us to be able to do the training that we were doing out in the nonprofit community. And they suddenly said, well, we're shifting our focus and we're not going to fund you any longer. So I think they gave us like three years. We're defunding you. Bye. <laughs> like, good luck. Um, and a lot of other things in the environment were changing. And so we had to reassess. We're like, hmm, you know, what, what do we do here? Do we close the organization down? Is that, why are we done? Um, and it just so happened that at that time in the, in sort of the nation, national level, a lot of the state associations of nonprofits were really starting to kind of build and grow. And so we looked at that and we had a kind of steering committee of people who said, hey, why don't we do that? Let's think about what that would look like. And so it took some of the things that we had previously and 
and then built more onto that. So we had already been doing training, we continued that, but we had not been doing policy work. So all of a sudden, in a way, we renew and we become sort of a baby organization again, right? In some of these areas, which we didn't know anything about, we had to build that all up. So, you know, I've been there now 23 years between the first organization and Hano. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see it go through this kind of review and renew stage. So some organizations might decide, you know, we're, they're not going to be around any longer. And that sometimes happens. But more often than not, what we're really doing is saying something's changed in the environment and we need to change in response to that. So it might just be that our mission shifts or we're going to do something in a very different way than we've been doing. And we kind of do that assessment and then we renew and refresh and kind of, you know, begin again in some ways, at least as, as part of the organization. So I'm just kind of going to look around the room and, and say to you, think to yourself, where do you see your organization right now? Um, and if anybody wants to share, you can, but you don't have to. Some of you did at the beginning. Um, but does this kind of resonate with you? Like you can see yourself somewhere in there. Also, just to say that oh, while this looks sort of linear with the arrows, sometimes we do a little bit like, right, this kind of thing, right? Um, and sometimes, for example, organizations, even startup organizations early in their life stage might sort of come with really sophisticated programs that might be fairly, you know, already great off the ground, getting to be fairly mature. It's just different organizations have different situations going on. So the organization might be younger, but have some mature aspects and mature organizations might have some new baby things they're growing, right? And, and anyway, so, um, so all of you kind of have a sense of where you, where you are in that. Okay, good. Um, and like I said, it's really important when we're starting to think about potential board members to be clear about what life stage we're in, because as I said, good governance looks different depending on where you are in that stage of organizational development. So one of the things that I think that we want to keep in mind as we're looking at potential board members, thinking about recruiting board members is when we're a startup, when we're a young organization, when we're all volunteer and we're a working board, we have to be clear when we're inviting people onto a board like that, that's what we are, right? That's the expectation. You're going to come in, roll up your sleeve, do the work, right? We're doing it. Um, and so the time commitment tends to be more intensive. They need to know that. But it's a super exciting, creative, like if you're the person who loves the build it stuff, like you are the board member for us, right? Um, boards of more mature organizations or organizations with staff that are operating more as that policy making kind of board, providing strategic direction and oversight. Some people want to join a board like that. They want to come in and know that everything's in place. It's built. You got a good system. I just got to show up at the board meetings, give my mana'o, and then we're good, right? That commitment, time commitment might be less, you know, sort of less intense, maybe less hands-on, but it also might be more routine. Some people find that boring. They're like, oh, you know, okay, great. Come to the meeting. There's a report. Oh, you know, so it depends on kind of like who you are in terms of thinking about who you're going to look for and how you share with folks where you are so that they know if it's the right fit for them. As I said, transitions between those different stages can be awkward and sometimes it feels uncomfortable. And Paige was describing a little bit of like, eh, like we're kind of trying to find our way, right? Very natural, totally, completely normal. Growing pains, right, <laughs> for the organization. Um, so I just suggest there, I think what's important when we hit some of those spots is to kind of recognize that and then say, yeah, we're in a growth period and something's changing. So what's emerging? What do we need to think about? And maybe we will start to talk about, you know, that the, the roles that we've been doing might shift and somebody else is taking on some of that. And in each organization that might look different, right? But you get to decide how you want to structure that. Um, but it's important to acknowledge it and talk about it, right? Otherwise, everybody's like, something isn't right, but I don't know what it is, and it just feels awkward. And mm. so put it out there and just say, hey, this is normal. This is, this is what happens when we start to grow the organization. So the board development cycle, um, and you see there a reference to one of those principles and practices um, that talks about board term limits specifically in this case. Um, 
there's nothing that says in Hawaii law that you have to have term limits for your board. Some boards do, some boards don't. There's pros and cons to both. We'll talk a little bit about that. But the important thing that I wanted to share is that there is a cycle to board development, right? So we, we, we kind of said, hey, this is going to be about board recruitment. But in order to think about board recruitment, we have to kind of look at the whole cycle and see where that fits in. So board development is this ongoing process that we're always doing as an organization, trying to build and maintain a strong board. So it starts with um, this idea that we're going to identify, cultivate, and recruit prospective board members, right? We got to be out there looking. We got to know who we're looking for. And then we got to do some kind of work to figure out whether they're the right fit. And then hopefully we're going to recruit them onto the board if they are. There's obviously a time, you know, period where we're wanting to orient new board members. Um, one great strategy is to pair them up with someone who's been on the board a little bit longer. Board buddies, a good idea, right? Because when you're new on the board, sometimes you're like, I hear all this stuff going on. I don't really know what you're talking about. I don't want to ask because maybe I should know already, but I don't. I'm embarrassed. So if you have a board buddy, you can just kind of say, hey, what's going on? Tell me a little bit more about that, right? Um, and of course, there are more uh, sort of formal ways we might orient people. Sometimes we have a, a handbook or a manual that says, here's some of the history and some of this information that you might want to know. Um, certainly, we're going to talk story with them and help them kind of get up to speed. But typically, it's at least a year before most new board members feel like they have a grasp of what's really going on. Um, it takes time, right? Um, Certainly, we want to continue to engage board members um, to become more active, right? And some of this happens through committee work that we have, page some of the projects that your board members are doing, right, that are very hands-on. Um, but, and I think this is coming up in, in a slide soon, but part of engaging folks, and I hear this all the time, people say to me, yeah, we have a board, but they're not very engaged. I don't know why. And I say, well, have you asked each of the board members kind of how they connect to your mission? Like, what are they passionate about? What do they want to do? Oh, no, not really. I mean, like, they came on the board. We, we thought they were good. You know, they got good skills. So I say, I think it's really important to ask them, right? And, and ask them every year. Like, what's resonating for you this year? What are you interested in doing? What's really exciting to you about the direction we're headed, right? Because that helps us to know where to plug them in right, that's going to be a good fit for them. If we don't ask and they don't say, we might end up kind of putting them somewhere where they're not very excited to be and they're not going to be very engaged. Do you think that's a good idea to have like a sort of structured interview for the board members? I think that's a great idea. Do you guys do that? <laughs> no, I'm, I mean, I think some folks do, right? Well, it's I a great think, idea. You know, I, I think at the time that we brought new board members mm -hmm. on, we, we wouldn't have known how to structure mm. an interview or what to ask. It's sort of <laughs> yeah. from what has gone wrong. Right. Then, By process of elimination, we now know <laughs> what not to do. <laughs> right. You know, right. a lot of us have said we're gray-haired. We want new younger members. Right. Which we went through, too. And when we brought on younger members, I think we weren't mm -hmm. aware enough of the generational gap or these particular board right. members. Right. You know, they were kind of disenfranchised from the system. Which right. I think we didn't realize how much problems and uh, decisions that would cause. Sure. And sure. knowledge about how to operate as a board member. Um, you know, it, right. it's almost, um, I've had a lot of experience with different boards. And sure. I usually try and start a new board with um, like a retreat. I mean, it can yes. be a, a coffee hour kind yeah. of thing. But just to give them some history, like yes. them ask questions, um, especially if there's a lot of financial information, which is often overwhelming mm -hmm. for the average person, just to break it down and make it you know, simple for them to understand. Absolutely. <laughs> that sounds like a great way to do it to me. And yeah, I think a structured process, I mean, Board culture differs, right, from organization to organization. Some are very, like, chillax, super, don't want anybody to feel like anything's too formal. But even with that, having a talk story, just to kind of get to know each other is really valuable. And my, set, my, my thought, and we'll 
you're anticipating exactly where we're going to go next. But my thought is that we really do want to talk to them and have them ask us questions and we ask them questions before we even really sort of like make the formal ask for them to join the board, right? Because if it's not a good fit and we end up having them on the board, it usually doesn't go well. Either they're just not active or they're unhappy or they never show up to meetings or, and you know, and then we've got a space on the board being taken up by somebody who's kind of dead weight, right? Which is not useful. I wonder how you figure out the right questions. Well, I have some, I have some suggestions for you. <laughs> Boy, did you come to the right session? <laughs> And of, of course, other folks can add in as because they, they've had experience as well. Um, I did just want to say a little bit about term limits that um, even for organizations that don't have term limits for board members, I would suggest that you rotate leadership among the, the officers. That at least can bring some kind of refresh energy, et cetera, to, right? Um, but again, as I said, some boards have board, board term limits, some do not. What's nice about having term limits is that it allows the board to evolve with the organization. And that sometimes doesn't happen, right? We have founders where it's great in the moment, we all know what this is all about. Then things change over time and we may not be as comfortable with all the changes, right? So having new folks join the board, while all the great people who have the institutional knowledge are there, but we're getting a little bit of influx of new energy skills and ideas, but we can also strategically re-recruit really good board members, right? So a recommended practice that some folks who have board uh, term limits do is they have two terms of two to three years for board members. So you might be on the board for four to six years, then there's a mandatory year off where, whew, take a breath, go do some other stuff that you love, Meanwhile, we might invite you to be on a committee still, right? That is not, you don't have to come to every board meeting, but you're still doing some engaged work with the organization. And if we really like you and you really like us, after that year off, we can invite you back, right? So it, it doesn't mean that if we have term limits, bye-bye, like you're never coming back and being on this board, right? I would recommend that you bring those good guys back. But by giving them a break, it allows other folks to come in, but it also gives them a, a break to kind of refresh themselves, right? And come back with renewed enthusiasm and energy. So, um, but again, not it, there's nothing that says you have to have term limits. And for some organizations that don't have them, it works. Like they feel really good about the fact that they've got great institutional knowledge. We're not losing people who had that great mana'o. They're all still here, right? But it can also, trust me, I get a lot of phone calls. More often than not, the root of the problem is we don't have term limits. And we got some board member who really is difficult in some way, and they're not going anywhere. <laughs> and you might even say, you know, well, they don't, they, don't, they don't really do anything. Why are they still here? But when you ask them, they're like, nope, I still want to be here, <laughs> right? So because we don't have term limits, we can't do anything about that. So just food for thought. Um, also, rotation methodology you see there, I think this is kind of common sense, but obviously if we do have term limits, we're not going to have everybody roll off the board at the same time, right? We have to preserve that knowledge that, you know, is the common thread, right? So we're going to have staggered terms, right? So some folks, when we start an organization, some folks might have a two-year term, some might have a three-year term, et cetera. And we want to make sure that we don't lose all the folks that have all the knowledge all at one time. So that is important. If you have term limits, you want to make sure you're doing that. Is that yes. Also important yes, it is. Okay. Right, it is. Um, absolutely, because you still, as I said, might be wanting to think about how you're rotating responsibilities within the leadership in the in the on the board, right? And Possibly and continuity. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so we want to educate. Going back to the cycle here. We want to educate the board about the organization's work and context. A lot of times we are doing that pretty effectively as we're sharing out with board members, uh, you know, here's what's going on. Here's the next project we're going to undertake. If you're a working board, yeah, you're there, you know it. Um, but sometimes as an organization matures and board members are doing more of that policy making and oversight, they may not be as connected to the work of the organization. And so over time, 
you know, we have to think about how do we continue to help them be um, aware of what's going on, be connected and tapped in, um, share with them, like, here's what's changing, or um, maybe they're sharing that with you. In the ideal situation, they are representative of the community, right? So they are sharing with you what's changing. Um, if you do have term limits, then you're rotating board members out to make some room for those new folks. Um, one thing that I suggest, and we're not going to talk a lot about it in this session, a little bit more in the next session, is that you do board self-assessment every couple of years or so. There's a lot of tools out there, free tools. You can pick whatever tool works for you. But this is the idea that the board is assessing itself. Nobody outside your organization is assessing you. But you're checking in and saying, how's it going for us as a board? How are we working together? Um, are there things that we want to do relative to board development? You know, what are some things, some new things we want to learn? Or if we're having some challenges, what's going on? And, and how do we kind of help ourselves, you know, be more effective as a board? Um, so I would say, you know, every couple of years, it's good to do something like that. And then this is one that we often forget, right? Because if we're doing really important work, the work never ends, right? There's always something new and important and critical that we need to do. But as I think, Cheryl, you were sharing this morning, like you're at a point where you should be celebrating, right? Because like, finally, we got this thing done or it's almost over the finish line. And we need to take time to pause as boards and kind of do that and say, oh my God, this was huge. Look what we just accomplished. Because, not because we need to have a big party and, and do all that, you can, but the idea is that when we can experience that success and not just move right into the next crisis, you know, then we get renewed energy to kind of take on that next big thing, right? So don't forget to kind of celebrate and say, oh, this is a big thing, this is a big deal, we did it, we did it. Okay, so that's the board development cycle. And I want to give you guys a few minutes not to hear me talk, um, but to do some personal reflection, um, because we're going to start to talk about now the actual recruitment process. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to make a little quick bullet point list. Everybody have your list or need a minute? Yeah. Some people are still working. We'll give it another give it another minute. Thank you, Patty. Okay. Anybody else need more time? Raise your hand. Okay. You could get a snack if you're done. <laughs> Stretch.
Okay, everybody ready? Great. So in the debrief, um, I'm not gonna make everybody share if you don't wanna share, but I would love it if we had some volunteers who might be willing to share a couple items on your list, doesn't have to be the whole list, but share a characteristic that you think would make someone a good board member for your nonprofit and tell us why. Okay. For me, I would put someone who shares the same passion and values as me. Okay, so shares the same passion and values as you. Gotcha. In a moment. Great. Thank you. Yes. Single, unemployed, no familiar obligation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and so, and tell and us, okay, sorry, I forgot, I forgot to ask you. So, Leimomi, tell us why that's important. I forgot the most important part. For me. We'll come back to that one. Why, why was it important for them to share that passion and the values? Because the, same that we both, you know, friends, we do friends. Now that's Malma, that's how Paul came okay. I grew up and lived in Hilo all my life. Okay. Um, when I moved out Malco, I met the best group of people mm. I ever had in 50 years. Mm. Because we all had, they had the same passion as I had values as I did. Mm -hmm. And that was to serve people who needed something that they didn't have. Uh. And to do it in a way that in Aloha, yeah. which is actually the beginning of our mission statement. Uh, uh, because of these women, actually, mm. my past. Don't feel bad, Ben, in the back there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the value. And so it makes yeah. it easier for me to commit to the organization uh -huh. because of the past that I did. Gotcha. And so, sort of like that energy of the shared commitment that people have allows you to really do that work effectively. Okay. Excellent, thank you. Sorry, now let's come back to single, no familial <laughs> obligations. What was the other one? Unemployed. Unemployed. Are, all your time. Okay. <laughs> so tell us, tell us why that's important. I'm stuck at this point right yeah. now. Yeah. I don't have that time that I wish I had. Yeah. Because I'm now a 63 year old grandmother babysitting a brand new child. Yeah. And it's like my heart. Goes out to these gals and they got my back. Right. I'm unable. Right. But it was mostly a joke, but I guess now. It's not that much of, right? I mean, it's on this. You know, I mean, it's, it's interesting to think about with the life stage, right? Where if you're really looking for, if your board is pretty hands on, then you might be saying to people, yeah, I mean, we need people who can commit time, right? Whatever, whatever your personal life looks like, like we're asking you to commit significant time right so you make your choice if that's a fit for you or not yeah that's good to, to yeah up, um, we had a seven member board and due to lifestyle choices three of them don't have a a cell phone mm. or a car uh yeah Ooh. yeah Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Really yeah I mean, it's really hard sure to even a functioning policy board when you can't yeah, <laughs> true, true that. Okay. Becky, you have. Just yeah, that. please. So on my list, availability. Availability. We have a board member who is awesome, but creates the Kona, and misses uh, the uh, it's Oh, yes. Excellent board member, but yes. not available. Right, right. So, and kind of hard to get his excellence right when he's not available to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Paige. Yeah, I, I add to what Eileen mm -hmm. said that those lifestyle choices, while you might support them, it, it sort of means that they're kind of saying MOP shouldn't function in the governmental system that mm. we have. Mm. And, and, and it'll come down to things like, no, we don't want to buy that software, mm -hmm. even though the county uses it. Right. And so it, at first, you know, we knew that at the beginning, or I did, but I didn't realize how it would play out in day-to-day uh -huh. -day, um, life and decisions yeah. for our nonprofit. Yeah. So that gets back to how do we figure out the good questions. Right, right. And we will definitely come to that.
I, I would add to yeah. it um, communication skills. Communication skills. The ability. Um, we have people that are smooth talkers, but then it, it, it almost obscures. It's like, where's the product? You know, uh -huh. we, we talk good, like we can produce this product. <laughs> but then but it doesn't the show product? up. <laughs> yeah. Where's the product? And, yeah. And then, um, or they, they'll, they'll, they'll load a conversation with this very tech heavy mm -hmm. stuff that, that sounds very impressive. Right. But it's like, do we really need that? We're right. not a multi-million dollar corporation. Right. right. Like, can you communicate that in a way that makes sense to those of us who don't speak tech? So we know, is that really a good investment for us at this I, stage I, or not? Yes, right? right now we're having yeah. a big debate about do we need a tech policy and passwords and guidance. Mm, like, come mm. on, you know, who wants to bust now? Hack mom. <laughs> Uh, yeah, right. I mean, I guess, but these are things that are coming up more and more, right? Like the cybersecurity stuff yeah. in the last couple of years has become even more important. No, I, but, I agree it's so important, but, you know, I yeah. think that, that at the appropriate kind of level, like a very tech heavy yeah. policy development, like spins us off into the yeah. side road that yeah. we don't need right now. It may not be at the appropriate level for what you need, right? Which is where you also might want to rein people back in a little bit, yeah, yeah which you're yeah. doing. Okay, so definitely good communication skills. Any other ones you wanted to add, Paige? Well, I think we're at the ground and growth stage. Mm -hmm. We have a overworked and executive director, so I, I still would look for board members that have enthusiasm that want to yeah. lead and actually implement okay. projects. So who have enthusiasm and want to actually lead projects, like they're still willing to get in there and roll up their sleeves and, and be part of this in an active yeah. way. Okay. Great. Yes, I know. Um, to back page up as the executive director, and we are coming up to the um, annual meeting in May, I believe. Okay. Um, I'm looking for board members to do fit. Uh huh. And and so I, I'm looking at a, a, a great variety of skills. Mm -hmm. Someone who has you know corporate administrative skills, but can also uh -huh. also function at the nonprofit level. Okay. Really helpful. So corporate administrative skills, but also nonprofit yeah, knowledge. Nonprofit. Okay. Um, people, we, we do a lot of ag and gardening. Mm -hmm. So people who have competency in that. So specific knowledge about the mission and the work we're doing. Right. Agriculture, okay. reforestation, okay. biologists, and then also some IT people. Okay. Because that is always helpful. Okay. Um, so IT I skills. It's and I'm like, yeah, I'm right, there. right. You know, so, um, <laughs> and just because of the kind of projects that we do, it's mm -hmm. helpful to have people who are kind of like contractors and ah. that kind of thing. So okay. I look at all of those skill sets uh -huh. going around hunting for board members. Yeah. So things you know your organization is going to need, those specific skills, you're on the lookout for folks who have those skills. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Good. And Representation always good. Okay. Attorney, or an insurance professional. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I, Chris, and then I want to come over here oh, no, back no, to no, Paige. No, no, no. Okay. I, I was just going to add on. Oh, to yeah, yeah. Go okay. ahead. Um, yeah. So I I put down probably the same things that they only and K House put down. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was dedicated to the mission, willing to, oh, willing to learn and grow. Ah, and let's add that one. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So just as an example, um, this, another board that I am on, they yeah. just got a new president, mm -hmm. and he made a presentation of how he's going to run things, mm -hmm. and it says, I expect you to put in a minimum of 10 hours of volunteer oh, oh, time okay. per month. Okay. And I am going to be calling you mid month to follow up on your on your tasks. Wow. Okay. <laughs> these, these are our <laughs> and, and these are the committees. And, yeah. You know, will you chair this committee? Huh? This one, who do you want as your second? Yep. You know, um, and it was like a big eye opener. Wow. I was, yeah. I was I was used to going to board meetings and kind of going, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I saw that little crack the whip over there, right? Like, whoa, he's like really like getting in there, huh? But it's really important that they want to learn yeah. and grow, I think. Absolutely. Uh, because we're getting all this great knowledge right. from, um, from Hano, from uh, the Hawaii Community Foundation, from the county. Right. You know, this is giving us the opportunity, and we don't need to have stagnant. Right. A, a stagnant attitude. Right. Going, well, I, I know it all. Yeah. Right. So kind of that openness, right, to learn and grow, as you said, and right. that growth mindset, like, oh, there's more out there that we could know and would be helpful to us. Yeah, excellent. Kate, she had something. That was a great segue to what I was going to say, which is a little bit off the topic of mm. criteria, but I think it's really important not to sort of have this poverty of expectations, like, mm. you know, to, I, I, for, I've been on my board for like 2012, I mm -hmm. think, and it was always like, oh my God, nobody wants to be on our board, we're mm. working to get who we get. Yeah. And so I would have been scared of like, oh my God, you have to work with it. But I think mm. it's really important. I think the resilient people taught us that, like, this is a great organization that's going to be wonderful for you to be part of it. And we have criteria. You got to pack, you know, you got to be yeah. a great person to be on our board. And I think that really helps you get better board members when you go out there with that Absolutely. expectation. Page. You just finished off the rest of the train. No, that is that is seriously the message that I share with everybody, which is a lot of times we have this attitude that, you know, if we invite someone on the board, we have to say, like, we'll really minimize what you have to do. Don't worry, it's not that big of a deal. And No, we go in there and we say right out at the front, hey, this is an awesome organization. We are working hard. We're doing some amazing stuff, but we have expectations, yeah. I mean, we think you're great and we'd love for you to join us, but there are gonna be things that we're asking you to do. And I guarantee you that the board members who join that board are gonna be way more likely to actually help you than folks who you're kind of begging to come on the board and promising that there won't really be too much that they have to do and don't worry about, you know. I say go for it and really kind of step up and to sell our expectations. Absolutely. I mean, realistically, don't like, you know, over, you know, don't do too much whip cracking before they are even on the board. But, but yes, absolutely. So, Paige, thank you for saying that. You're absolutely 100% right. Susan, Susie. I'm not sure how you scan for this, but personal time integrity since we're responsible. Yes, integrity. Yes. That's a huge clue. Yes. So the idea of integrity, particularly because we're stewards of funds that are not ours, Public right? Funds. Public funds, exactly. Yes, I mean. Well, just as Susie said, integrity is, is also leads to um, knowing how boards function. There has to be confidentiality. Confidentiality, and, yeah. And, and a lot of members, especially younger people, do not understand the responsibilities of a yes. board. In, the, in that respect. Yeah. So maturity. So maturity, maturity. maturity. But maturity can look a lot of different ways, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you set the expectations clearly, then they can, you know, either agree or not. And yeah, provide training. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's where the onboarding documents, yes. which we never knew to create, right. you know, the, I think those would really help. Can come in really handy. Like yeah. Any folks who are just coming in can come and sit down. Come come join us. No, no worries. <laughs> um, great. So one more, and then we're going to move on. Yeah. It's not just the integrity of the board member yeah. being responsible because the organization is responsible for funding. Right. They're also responsible to the people they serve. Absolutely, the community, right? Yes. Integrity in that way as well is super critical, right? Yeah. I would also throw in for our board a yeah. sense of humor. <laughs> a sense of humor, I love it. I was waiting for that one to show up. Enjoying each other's yeah. company, enjoying working together. Exactly. Because that way they want to come to the meeting. That's right. They want to come to and they'll take it seriously, but they don't take themselves too seriously, right? Right. That was my word. 
along with creative. You got to be creative. Because creative, really yes. Happens in the world. You got to pivot. Yeah. You know, and find that corner in the egg. Yeah, okay, absolutely. we're good. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Humor. And humor and creativity. Excellent. And then I want to make sure we get yours, Barbara. This one is really hard, but our new member. What it is is I try to determine if the person has a good heart. Good heart, okay. Good yeah. heart, and that's really difficult to <clears throat> assess if you just talk. Sorry. Yeah. So what I did, ran into this young lady. She's an artist. She was an art teacher. She published a book for kids on art. So I said to her, I said, you know, we're going, our kid and I are going to have a table at the um, Hawaiian Beaches. What the hell? Swabby? No, I think they've done about it. Anyway, oh, okay. Okay. You know, okay. I said to her, I said, would you be willing to mm. actually provide some of your books mm. as a gift? For a drawing mm -hmm. that the kids would put their name into. And she said, I'd be happy to do that. I said, Oh, great. So I then I said, Would you be willing to come to the Makatiki and help our table? She said, I'd be happy to do that. I said, Would you be willing to bring your husband along? Barbara's got strategy. <laughs> I observed this woman. Really? I observed yeah. this woman the whole time. We were in the process of applying for a special permit. We had our plot plan. She actually had people sign up to say that they were going to write letters of support to the county. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And she got the kids to put their names in the in the hat for a drawing, and then we announced. The, so the parents came, brought the kids back. There were a couple, I think the parents had taken the kids home. Right. She called them <clears throat> and she mailed them. Wow. Kid. Okay. I'm also hearing initiative. Initiative is and a good now, thing. Yes. Out that she also does volunteer work at the zoo. Wow. You know, so, so she has a good heart. Yeah. So I, to the other board members, I think we should encourage her, see if she wants to be part of our team. Yes. And so I said, I said, her name is Kitty. I said, Kitty, would you be willing to serve on the board now that you know what we're about? Yep. You know, we gave her our our, our mission mm -hmm. and all of that. And she said, Well, let me think about it. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then she said, when I went back to her, yeah. she said, Yes, I'd be happy to do that. So she came to our first meeting. And this is what I'm saying. This woman is an artist. Okay. She also said, we're talking about our financial record keeping and blah, 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 you know, and I'm the treasurer and I need to know how to use QuickBooks. Right. We've been trying to do this for right. several years. Right. And then she said, I took a course in QuickBooks. <laughs> and I thought, oh. oh. And she said, yes, you know, I really love numbers. So she's artistic. But so I said, keep the two sides of the brain working. <clears> Left brain and right brain, right? Absolutely. So I believe that Katie is a godsend. Yes. But you really, you really don't know until you actually give them an opportunity. Yes. To demonstrate what they're good at, what they enjoy. Yes. It, it's hard to determine that just by talk story. You, you, you need to yeah. engage them in an activity. Just to see what happens. So Barbara could also teach the class because that's my next slide coming up after this one. <laughs> no, I mean, you guys, I, this is really making me feel good. You already know what you need to do and you're doing it. Barbara, that's absolutely spot on. So we're going to come to that in a minute. But I'm really glad that you had that opportunity to do that with her and that she said yes when you invited her, right? Because you had done the cultivation work. That's what I would call that part of it. Absolutely. I just want to go over a couple things, and I know we're, you know, we're going to get to our time soon here. So, um, but but we're going to get to um, Barbara's slide next. But I would suggest that when you, most of us have a nominating committee on the board, right? Might even might be just a couple people, but it's good to have a nominating committee. Um, and what they're really thinking about again is that identifying, cultivating, and recruiting piece of it. And I would encourage you to do it strategically. So here's some thoughts. Look at who's on your board now. 
ask, is this board inclusive of the community impacted by the work we do? This was to your point, Mimomi, too, right? If not, who's missing, right? So who might not be here yet that we want to invite onto the board? Review your forward-looking plans. I no notice I didn't put strategic plan. Some people have them, some people don't. Whatever plans you have that let you know where you're headed, look at those plans and then say, what kind of skills, this is Eileen's strategy, what kind of skills and knowledge will we need as our organization grows and develops, right? We're gonna look at what the gaps are between what we have and what we need, and then we create our strategy. Now we know who we're looking for, right? Instead of just going around and saying, will you please be on my board? Like, let's be strategic about and look at your list that you made, right? These are the qualities that we're looking for. Um, and on that list that you have, look for board members that meet multiple criteria. So Barbara, she might not even have written down those criteria, but she knew it when she saw it that Katie is Katie had multiple right checked off many boxes on her list. So not everybody is going to check off all your boxes, but you want to look for people who have multiple box checked. Okay, um, be picky, <laughs> right? This was to our earlier conversation. Everybody does not have to be on your board. I think, it, especially in our state, we have organizations that have deep roots, right? We start the organizations for a really important reason. We have deep roots in the community. We have those core values that you talked about. And we wanna make sure that as we bring people in, they are aligned with those like deep roots and core values. So we wanna identify people that are a possible fit. This is Barbara, this is your slide. And then we're gonna assess their level of commitment to the mission, the vision, the values. And how do we do that? We say, you know, would you come volunteer? Or we notice they have already been volunteering. Are they a member? If you have a membership, you know, have they donated in some way to your organization? Have they come to your events like Katie did, right? Have they served on a committee? Sometimes, as long as our bylaws don't say that we have to only have board members on our committees, we might have committees where we invite other folks that aren't on the board to be part of those committees. And that's a great way to kind of test drive <laughs> a person who might be on your board, right? They get a little look-see at how it works on your board and then you get a little look-see at them and you kind of go, oh yeah, this looks like a good fit. Now I'm gonna ask them to be on the board. So here are all those great questions that Barbara was asking as she was cultivating. Um, and okay, we wanna also share information about our organization and find out what do they wanna know about us? We ought to be clear about the life stage, right? We already talked about that so that we can convey realistic expectations. And then we wanna ask them things like, where do they feel most engaged with our mission? What do they wanna learn, accomplish, or gain from their board service? That's a really critical question, right? Because sometimes we go, oh, this person has a finance background. They're gonna be the treasurer. They may not wanna be your treasurer. They may wanna be there for an entirely different reason, but if we don't ask, we might mismatch them, right? So what do they wanna gain or learn from being on the board? What are their goals? And then you have to think about, does that fit with what we have to offer and what we need, right? Um, but additionally, here are some things that you should share. Have somewhere articulated, whether it's in, uh, you know, sort of in writing or you're sharing, sort of the organization, it's, you know, mission, history, when it was founded, where is your base of operations? What's the annual revenue of the organization? This gives board members a sense of kind of like, what are we talking about here? Um, if you have paid staff, what's the number that you have? Is it a small staff, a larger staff? We have no staff, <laughs> it's all volunteer. How often do we meet? How long do we typically meet for? Do we have three hour meetings, one and a half hour meetings? You know, um, Sharing what we're looking for. Right, so be intentional. We're looking for these kind of skills, this kind of expertise. This is the role that we'd love for you to play if you were to join our board. And share the expectations that you have, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then also share with them, you know, if they look like a potential good fit, what is your process for selecting board members? How do you onboard them? I know some folks, you know, have applications. They have a little bit more formal process. Some people's process is a little less formal, but share with them, like, how do we make these decisions? We have a committee, they're gonna come together, or we're gonna all interview you, we're gonna go out to you know, lunch, talk story, 
whatever it is, so that they know what to expect. And be prepared, expect them. If they're a good potential board member, they should ask you this question. What are you looking for and why me? I'd wanna know, why do you want me to be on your board? What's the culture of the organization? I'd wanna know that if I were joining a board. What's really going on in the organization? Like, yeah, I, I see what your mission is. I see some stuff about you in the, you know, in the social media, whatever. Tell me what's really going on. Like, where, where are you at, right? And then be prepared additionally to share. This is something that I think is really valuable. A few things that the organization is most proud of doing in the last couple of years. Or if you're just starting up, however long you've been around, a couple things you're really proud of. And your thoughts on one or two things, improvements that would enable the organization to better fulfill your mission going forward. Now, if you're sharing that with me as a board member, I know you know what you're doing, right? If you can tell me that, I know a lot more about your organization and you. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. You said um, expect them to ask you the second bullet. Yeah. What What is your expectation to as an answer for what the second bullet? Yeah, I mean, when I say that, I mean something like I might say, you know what, we're very casual. Like, okay. we just, you know, we have meetings at so and so's house, and we do, you know, or it's a little bit more corporate style, or whatever, whatever, however you define sort of the culture of the organization. I don't mean necessarily like native culture, although you might say that too. I just mean like, what's it like? How do you behave with each other? What's your style? What's your what's your vibe? Okay. Yeah, does that help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're almost we're almost done. Um, setting and communicating clear expectations is the last part that we're going to talk about. And you know, I shared the whole board development cycle before, but we're really focusing on the recruiting part, right? But we're gonna move a little bit into, once we got these great people on the board, how do we make sure they know what the expectations are so that they can behave up to our expectations? So I would suggest to you that a board member commitment form is an awesome tool to do that. And I'm gonna share a sample with you after the session. I'll send it to you by email. Um, but you can create whatever version of it you want. There's just th that sample is just one version. But you can add things in there like what are the duties. For example, we expect you to you know, attend at least X percent of the meetings, right? Um, we expect you to serve on a committee or two committees or whatever your expectation is. We expect you to personally contribute to the organization if you have a board giving whatever. Again, yours might change, but... Um, provide, if we have staff, we expect you to provide support and advice to the staff, but avoid interfering in management activities, right? The staff is managing, the board is governing. The code of conduct, and we're gonna talk about that in the second session, there are duties of care, obedience, and loyalty that board members on those governing boards have. So we can outline them in the board member commitment form. We can say, this is what it looks like. In, and, and the sample has a really nice brief articulation of that. And then it can also, you can also add things like, as a board member, I agree to, you might put some of those things on your list in there, act with honesty and integrity, work with respect you know, for my peers who serve on the board, leave my personal prejudices out of board, just anyway, you, you see where I'm going with that. You can create a, a commitment form that you have new board members sign and existing board members, maybe they re-sign it every year, right? We're recommitting to this, but this helps us to kind of understand what are our expectations and then a reminder of kind of what does that look like. And you have complete flexibility about how you want to create something like that. Um, so the resources that I'm going to follow up with you about um, are I'm going to send you a sample board member commitment form. Some of you may find a board matrix kind of tool helpful, like if you're trying to plot who you have now, who you're looking for, and kind of get a sense of that. I have something I can share with you. Um, I know some people, when, when I asked you in the pre-questions, some people mentioned it would be really helpful to know what to put in that board handbook or the orientation information like onboarding, right? So I can share some of that with you as well. And then anything else that you want me to share, let's, let's take a few minutes and any questions you have or any kinds of other resources, let's jot them down so that I can make sure I include them when I follow up. Yeah. Um, I 
Does a board member have to be American? Oh, good question. Like a citizen of the United States? I'm not an attorney, so I am not going to give you an answer to that one just off the cuff. I, I, would, I can ask and find out for you. I think that's a really important question because there may be some issues around that that might be legal issues. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've someone's asked a question like this similar before, and I had to do a little research on that. Um, and yeah, there, there are just some things that you need to be aware of. Uh, it doesn't necessarily prohibit them from being a board member, but there might be some. Yeah. 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 I don't think it matters so much where you are, but the question is, are you a US citizen or not? Because there are just some things that happened after 9-11 that, that are in the law that relate to some funky stuff that we have to know about. So that's a good one. I will get back to you on that. Other questions? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to ask you. Well, yeah. One that I probably got right. How do you energize and excite your board members? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a big question. And I'll give you a short answer. And then we can certainly talk more about it, you know, off, offline. Um, but my guess is that part of it is about asking them kind of, if you feel like it's a little bit stagnant, you, for one thing that you can do is, first of all, check to make sure they all still want to be on the board, right? Some folks are not any longer able to be as active or engaged, but they don't want to say that they want to get off the board because they really care about you and the organization. Giving, kind of doing like an annual check-in with board members like that is valuable because it eases the way if someone says, you know what, things have changed. And I, I really love this organization, but I don't think I can be on the board anymore. And then you might say, okay, great. But they, they might say, I still want to help out. What could, what could I do for you that isn't being a full board member, but still helping out? And the reason I'm saying that is not everybody is going to be in that situation, but some of the folks that are not as energetic or enthusiastic, there might be a reason behind it. Like they're overcommitted. There's a lot going on. The other part of it is asking them, you know, yeah, so... So as we're moving forward, what are you excited about? Where, where do you want to be most engaged? What can we do to help you feel like you're really getting to do the work you want to do on the board? So asking. Um, it might be valuable to have, and I, I heard someone say, you know, maybe it was you, Eileen, that you start with a retreat. Like maybe it's time to go outside the board meeting and have a get together where you're just talking about kind of like where the organization is headed. And if you're, Sometimes that's where we get stuck is that everybody is not so clear on where we're headed or everybody has different great ideas, but we haven't kind of gotten alignment. So people aren't sure where to plug in yet. So that's another opportunity. So there's three short, short answers and we can always talk more about that. Yeah. Do they have books for this? I bet you they do. We could Google it and I bet you we'd find some. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's probably even a YouTube video about it. There's probably some posts on Instagram. No. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? I know we're at our time. If you think of them, if you're staying for part two and you think of them, we can always add them up on the flip chart sheet. Okay. Good job, everybody. <laughs> you have great strategies already in place, I can tell. So good work. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. Find your Katie. She sounds awesome. <laughs> All right, thank you.